Hi everybody, I'm Chuck McLennan, and welcome to another Buick Know How. Today we're going to talk about engine noises and their repairs. Four noises to be specific. You'll also see some special repair techniques that you'll want to adapt in order to work on engines in general. But first, let's spend a minute talking about Buick's engine exchange program. The program was started in 1987 by Buick and GM Powertrain. The initial goal was, and still is, to use returned engines as field data to improve the manufacturing quality of Buick production engines. This is a successful venture, but Buick is not through yet. The second goal came hand in hand, namely, the program has increased customer satisfaction. I'd like to introduce the senior project engineer on the engine exchange program, Mr. Dale Sterling of GM Powertrain. Hi Dale, and welcome to Buick Know How. Hi Chuck, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, you're right about the exchange program. We're improving our engines every year. That, in turn, has led to a bonus. Increased customer satisfaction. Why don't you uh, show us what happens to those exchanged engines? When a complaint engine is sent to GM Powertrain, it is completely tested, disassembled, and inspected for the cause of failure. One point you'll notice, Chuck, is that these technicians use the same tools, stethoscopes, micrometers, dial bore gauges, vernier calipers, and sometimes a magnifying glass, all normal tools available to any dealership technician. Once the problem is identified, we really get into it, using powerful electron microscopes. Incredibly close looks at bearing failures is possible. Special spectrographic procedures are then conducted to analyze and identify tiny particles that may be embedded in those bearings. You can see the actual particles and you also know what they are? We sure can. If we see, say, aluminum in a bearing, the readout can give me a list of elements of that particular alloy. Hold on, Dale. Let me get this straight. You look at a report and you can say, hey, this is our intake manifold here. That's exactly what I'm saying, Chuck, and we do it every day. Wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. But what can you actually do about it? Yeah, if possible, we can change a manufacturing procedure to prevent it from reoccurring, for one thing. But I need to point out that we see lots of failed engines due to improper repair techniques. Based on actual cases, I think I can provide your viewers with some general repair tips. Here's a good one. A Buick customer comes to the dealership with an engine noise, or worse, in this case, on the hook with catastrophic engine failure. On a current model year vehicle, the engine exchange program allowed the service advisor to offer the customer a new engine. Now, in the customer's mind, the car is as good as new and he's thrilled. In my opinion, that's a small price to pay to restore or to improve the customer's confidence in Buick. It'll be like new, the car? Brand new. Well, okay. So, general repair tip number one is use the engine exchange program whenever possible. Dale, let me point out you need to consult with your DSM for current repair policy. In other words, don't overpromise by offering an exchange engine until you find out if the car is eligible. If it's not eligible, you'll have to evaluate each situation on a case by case basis. So, in this case, we've got a happy customer? Yes, Chuck, but what caused the failure? It's important to find the cause. Let's look at the facts on this case. Originally, the customer brought his Buick in for an oil leak condition. It turns out to be an end seal leak, which gets repaired. About a week later, the car is back. This time, with a loud bearing knock. Now, these two events are linked, and I'll tell you how. As you all know, fixing leaks means removing all traces of the old gasket from the mating surfaces first. That's right. And here's how. Either scrape gaskets by hand or remove them chemically. I know. It takes more time. Well, Chuck, that's our problem. Common practice is to use small abrasive pads on a die grinder, sandpaper or sanding boards to strip gaskets. These all contain aluminum oxide, which is extremely abrasive. These things work quick. Iron, aluminum, aluminum oxide particles from the pad or sanding board eventually ends up in the oil pan. Whether or not, shop towels are used to plug oil drain holes. 
When the engine is reassembled, the leak is sealed, and so is its fate. But wait a minute, Dale. Doesn't the oil filter catch most of these contaminants? Well, that's actually a misconception. For the most part, oil filters do their job. But just at cold engine startup, oil pressure can spike up to 150 PSI. That's enough to force the filter bypass valve open to allow unfiltered, contaminated oil into the engine. Furthermore, the bypass is not always 100% closed. As the engine runs, each oil pump lobe creates an oil pressure surge that can bump the filter bypass valve open. That means small quantities of contaminated oil are continuously entering the engine. All those iron, aluminum, or aluminum oxide particles coat every engine part. When these abrasives wind up in the crank bearing oil film, you get a time bomb on your hands. Looks like uh, this one detonated. It lasted six days. We analyzed this bearing and it told me the same tale I've seen time and time again. In this case, aluminum particles and aluminum oxide, the key players in upper engine work with an abrasives pad. Here's a closer look. The crankshaft journal rotates in a pressure lubricated bearing. The oil layer that separates these two metal parts is equal to its clearance, about one thousandths of an inch per side. However, the crankshaft never spins on center. When a cylinder fires, the journal is forced to one side. Oil squeezes out to less than 40 millionths of an inch. That's pretty thin. Now, here comes trouble. Although aluminum oxide particles vary in size, compared to the 40 millionths thick oil film that they must squeeze through, they seem to be gigantic. When the particle is forced into the oil film under pressure, the hard bearing journal literally hammers the particle part way into the softer bearing material. The particle, being very hard, begins acting like a cutting tool and starts scoring the journal surface right away. It doesn't take long to destroy a crankshaft journal. So, here's repair tip number two. Cleanliness is extremely important. You know, Chuck, the cars we built 20 years ago were a lot different. They were big, heavy, noisy things, but our customers loved them. Our customers today are more demanding. They want a new level of quiet, but they still want power under the hood. With extra power comes more engine flexing. Although it's not much, flexing allows more movement between parts, and that makes more room for noises to occur. Crank journals have to be straight and I mean straight, with tight bearing clearances of about one and a half thousandths of an inch. Even so, customers hear bearing knocks when clearance may be only two thousandths of an inch. Well, so much for that old three thousandths rule of thumb. That's right. Many of the general rules we used to use are no longer any good. General repair tip number three is, to find the cause, you'll have to measure. You got it. Now. Let's look a little closer at things that can produce noise. Suppose a customer comments on a ticking sound that lasts for about three or four seconds at engine startup. This can be heard in the valley area. The hydraulic valve lifters can tick at startup if a non-OEM oil filter is installed. Not every aftermarket oil filter has an anti-drain back valve to prevent this noise. Regals and some of the older 3.8s may have this problem. So try a new GM oil filter. If a vehicle is brought in with a loud metallic knocking noise, the solution can be simple. A sharp crankshaft speed knock from the bottom of the engine can be caused by a backed out torque converter bolt. This can occur if the bolt was not properly torqued. If the bolts are properly torqued, look for a cracked flex plate. You can get a sharp crankshaft speed knock that sounds serious. Check out the flex plate before going into the engine. Flex plates crack if operated at angles. The center lines of the block and transaxle may change if either has been broached incorrectly. The transaxle case to engine block bolts may be loose, or the transaxle case dowel pins may be misaligned. The crankshaft end flange may have too much runout. Use a dial indicator to check out these possibilities.
A thump or knock noise may be caused by accessory drive belts. On 1992 and 1993, 3300 and 3800 engines, the belts had a tendency to pill. This is covered in bulletin 9267. Pilling is a condition where small particles of belt material separate from the belt to form clumps or pills in the belt grooves. These can be seen with a good off-car visual inspection. Some pilling is normal. Excessive pilling can cause a thump or knock sound every time a pilled section of the belt runs over a pulley. The belt jumps off, then slaps onto the pulley. So, you take the belts off and run the engine. That's right, but only for 30 to 45 seconds, max. This is pretty standard stuff, but it helps isolate engine and accessory noises. If the noise is still there, it could be a bearing knock which we'll get to in a minute. But if the noise goes away, check the belt for pilling. Then check the power steering pulley alignment. Inspect all pulley grooves for damage, paint, debris, or signs of belt material. If you find some stuff stuck in there, use a wire brush to clean the pulleys. Install a new belt. A knock noise may be caused by a power steering pump surge, according to Bulletin 93612. A loose hose that rattles or buzzes against the body sounds like an engine noise. If the hose is secure, check the power steering pump for shutter, especially on Skylark. Know how 133 covers steering shutter. Next, bypass the steering rack, because it's not a noise source. Route the pump pressure hose to the reservoir's return fitting. Start and run the engine. If the noise is gone, there could be a restriction in the pressure hose causing a vibration. So, replace the hose if it's kinked. If it's okay, reroute the hose away from the body. Right. Now, another thing you could check is fuel line knock. Look for loose HVAC case fuel line fittings. A light knocking noise is heard best from inside because the HVAC case amplifies the knock. Now. Let's look at our more specific cases. For example, number one main bearing knock and valve tick on the 33 and 3800 engines, and piston pin rattle and balance shaft rattle on the 3800 engine. Okay, now let's talk about bearings for a minute. If you measure one, as many of you know, it's slightly thicker in the middle. The 33 and 3800 engines are both 90 degree Vs. Every time a cylinder fires, the force hits the mains at approximately a 45 degree angle. In other words, the mains rotate in the area of the bearing where the most clearance exists. Sometimes a main bearing knock can result from belt tension and bearing clearance. When either of the front two cylinders fire, the forces push the number one main toward the lower bearing. The belt tension jerks that main up onto the upper bearing this can be heard with clearances of only two thousandths of an inch or more, and there may be no apparent bearing or journal damage. Here's what you do. Remove the belt, oil pan, and support the crankshaft. Remove the front main bearing cap. The support is used to hold the crank up on its bearings. Plastic gauging material can now be used to accurately gauge the clearance. What did you get? Looks like about a two thousandth. No, a bit less. Well, eight to eleven tenths of a thousandth means that the number one bearing is probably not the source of the noise. Look at the number two and number three mains. The number four is not likely to be the cause. If you measure twelve to seventeen tenths of a thousandth, install the lower half of a one thousandth undersized bearing shell, part number twelve thirty five. 0094 in the bearing cap. If clearance is 18 to 22 tenths of a thousandths, install both halves of a one thousandths undersized bearing. Part number 1235-0094. Being extremely careful not to nick the journal. Now, install the new bearing and torque all bearing cap bolts to 25 pound feet plus 45 degrees using the J36660 torque angle meter. Recheck the front main bearing clearance with gauging plastic. You should be at or just higher than eight tenths of a thousandth of an inch. 
reassemble the engine. A rod knock is another engine noise. A rod knock is a sharp, heavy metallic crankshaft speed knock. Rod knocks are continuous, coming from the bottom end of the engine. Unlike the mains, rod knocks can be more easily found. Use the Tech 1 to disable the fuel injectors, one by one, until the noise changes. After identifying the cylinder, remove the oil pan. Pull the rod down and away from the crankshaft. Remove and inspect the bearing. Also, measure the rod bore. Another type of noise is valve tick. Valve tick is best described as a light clicking type noise heard at or just above idle when the engine is fully warmed up. Listen for the noise with a stethoscope along the tubular steel exhaust manifold. The steel manifold amplifies the sound, so the loudest port identifies the cylinder. Once you know the cylinder, inspect its valve train components. You don't want to go in more than you have to, so check the rocker arms for side-to-side -side play, which could indicate a worn pushrod guide plate. Next, check both pushrod tips for wear. Check the push rods for straightness by rolling each one across a flat surface. Valve tick can be caused by a damaged or collapsed lifter or lifter guide plate. Remove the lifters one at a time for inspection. Take a look at the cam lobes for wear while each lifter is removed. A tick can even be caused by valve spring coils that touch. Boy, there's a tough one to diagnose, isn't it? You're not kidding. If you've gone in this far and haven't found anything, you should start to suspect the valve guides. Valve guides wear as the valve opens. The rocker arm pushes down on the valve stem tip to open the valve. At the same time, the rocker arm wipes across the tip of the valve stem, pushing the stem to the side. So, as the valve stem moves down the guide, it's also pushing against the side, causing wear. During closing, the opposite occurs as the valve wears the other side of the guide. Once the guide is worn, valve tick occurs as the valve closes. When the valve is almost closed, one point of the valve face crashes into the seat causing the tick because the lifter is not fully off the cam lobe. As the valve fully closes, the valve rocks into the closed position in the seat and the stem hits the side of the valve guide. Use dial indicator J8001 on the valve stem just above the guide. Clearance should be no more than three and a half thousandths at the top and bottom of the guide. This is another example where rocking the valve by hand to check the clearance just won't do. You have to measure. If you have hole gauges and a micrometer, use them if you got them. You have two choices to repair guides. You can ream the guide oversize and install oversize valves or replace the head. Piston pin rattle is another noise that can affect any engine. The rattling noise is noticeable at cold startup and may last up to five minutes. In severe cases, the noise can still be heard even when the engine is fully warmed up. Use a stethoscope to listen along the head-to-intake manifold area. The noise might be detected by shorting out the cylinders one by one if only one cylinder is affected. If one piston is affected, you'll hear a tick at camshaft speed. However, two or more affected pistons sound like a marbly rattle or a diesel type noise. Piston pin rattle is caused by high piston to piston pin clearance. The noise occurs just before top dead center on the compression stroke. As the piston travels up the cylinder, the compressed air fuel mixture knocks the piston bore onto the top of the pin, causing a tick or knock. If piston pin noise is detected, replace all six piston and pin assemblies. For now, the best way is to call your DSM. You'll receive a full set of six piston and pin assemblies for affected 1992 through 1994 3800 engines. These sets have minimal clearances. The last noise we're going to cover is balance shaft bearing rattle on 3800 engines. The customer may complain of a tinny rattle or a clattering noise when the engine is warm in park or drive. To identify this noise, use your stethoscope just below the throttle body at the top of the cylinder block. 
After identifying the noise, remove the balance shaft. Check the rear balance shaft bearing for signs of needle bearing scuffing, misalignment, or other damage. Rear balance shaft bearing noise can be caused by a tight timing chain link, a worn or incorrect timing chain tensioner, damaged or dirty balance shaft, or cam geared teeth. Dirty ball bearings or needle bearing tracks on the front or rear bearings. These are usually caused by carbon, sand, or excess RTV. Regardless of the cause, replace the balance shaft bearings and needle bearings. Check the balance shaft for maximum end play of eight thousandths of an inch. Front radial play should be no more than 1.1 thousandths, while rear radial play should be between five and 47 tenths of a thousandths of an inch. The gears should be checked for lash of two to five thousandths of an inch at 90 degree intervals. Just keep these few thoughts in mind. Use the engine exchange program whenever possible. Exercise cleanliness and measure engine components to identify wear that causes noise. Dale, thanks a lot for stopping by to lend us your expertise. We really appreciate it. The whole idea is to keep our satisfied Buick customers on the road. And when they're in for a repair, we need to use that opportunity to gain their trust and recover their confidence in Buick. See you next time on Buick Know-How.